Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Legend of Korra Book 3 Change episode review. This one's going to be for K312, Enter the Void, second last episode of the book. And uh, yeah, first of all, uh, I apologize for not getting the, this and the next review, which I'm going to record very shortly, uh, uh, up on Friday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the night before the finale and Friday, the day of the finale, I was uh, <laughs> I was sick, so I wasn't actually able to really um, one watch the episode like properly. Like I watched the episode, it's just I was sick while I did so, and it was just kind of like things are happening. Yay! This was good, but I, I couldn't really think that like hard about it, um, and obviously I I couldn't get in front of the camera to uh, actually record it. But um, I, I feel a lot better now, so I did record the podcast for this episode um, e yesterday, Sunday. We recorded the roundtable for K312, Enter the Void. On Saturday, I recorded an admin talk, episode 6, with Kevil from Avatar The Legend of Korra, online.com. So that's up there, and I, I give a few thoughts about the book 3 as a whole and stuff like that. We do our usual admin th talk thing there. But uh, yeah, the... Uh, Venom of the Red Lotus Roundtable is going to be next Sunday, and obviously now I'm going to cover these video style. Um, so yeah, interesting. For the first time this book, I've actually done the roundtable before I'm doing the video review, but um, uh, that's the way I had to do it here, sorry, but uh, I'm finally getting around to it. But uh, yeah, Enter the Void, uh, really good episode. Um, really perfectly did set up that last episode just with the way that the the cliffhanger of this episode ended with uh core chained up the idea of the poison and just it, it there's a mystery in that like you don't get like the reveal of what they're actually doing what the plan is it's just like we're gonna poison you and they don't say why what their aim is because there's a lot of mystery around it just because um they could have killed her at multiple points throughout the book they want to kill her in this specific way with poison. Like it's a really interesting way to end the episode, just with hero in peril. That's always like a good way to do that last episode. But this is an unusual thing the villains are doing. And then add to that the rest of the episode. Yes, it was it was um, effectively you know planning an attack during this negotiation thing, and then the actual execution of that negotiation slash attack. And there was a lot of different things happening, all the different groups going their various separate ways, action happening. But what I really liked was that it wasn't just action for action's sake, that there was a lot of emotion involved in it um, throughout the episode. So, um, for instance, the um, the big attack you know that happened during the episode was you had all these kind of battles and like connections going on during the fight. Like, you had Pali and Zaheer as the two Red Lotus members at Lahima's Peak. And obviously their um, boyfriend and girlfriend. And you, you had that scene beforehand where you really got over how much they care about each other. And then the people battling them are father-daughter pair, Korra and Tonrock. And they have their moment before the attack takes place where they're kind of... Um, you can see how much the trust has grown between them compared to, like, say, book two or early book two. Where they kind of had to deal with some of the kind of... Uh, trust issues in their relationship and then they get over that and they're kind of fighting Zaheer together and then you have um, Su Yin and uh, Lin, you know, sisters, you know, half-sisters who had huge issues earlier on in the book now kind of fighting and kind of showing how much they care about each other as they fight Pali. So it was this really cool dynamic that it wasn't just, okay, fight scene involving this character, this character, this character, and this character, that you could see the connections and they actively set it up. like. When Pali is attacking Su Yin and Lin, you have that moment where they're undercover and Lin says, you know, I'm going to draw her out and you can do something. I love you. And that was a really strong moment for Lin as a character, for her to be able to say that. Because even in the Metal Clan and Old Wounds where their relationship was addressed, they didn't go that far with the relationship to say... To have that kind of I love you kind of moment between sisters again. So that was very strong that they did that here. Um, and, you know, add to that the, the Pali and Zaheer moment. That, that was surprisingly good. I, it'll always have an asterisk for me. Just because, for me, that's the one scene in the entire series. That showed Pali as a character and not just a person with cool bending. It was really cool and made me want to know her even more. 
especially that line that she says to Zaheer, you know, when you saved me when I was a girl from becoming the a kind of killing machine of a warlord. I'm just like, tell us that story. That's super interesting because that plays into uh, the fact that <clears throat> Pali obviously discovered her powers when she was very young. This came to the attention of some warlord who wanted to use this extreme power for his own goals. It brings up the idea that Zaheer and Pali met when they were fairly young and their connection grew from there. That's really cool. The problem is they don't really tell us about it. That's the only little bit of backstory we get on Pali in this whole book because as later happens, she's killed in the fight. And again, that was a super strong moment to have in the um, strong emotional moment to have in the fight scenes. Again, just showing that it wasn't just a one-off thing that the Earth Queen was killed in this book. It wasn't just a tease at potential character death in the last episode, the ultimatum that, um, you know, Tenzin looks like he's almost dead, uh, Kai and Bumi look like they're almost dead, and, and all this sort of stuff that... No, Pali died in this fight scene in one of the more brutal ways we've ever seen, probably the most brutal way we've ever seen in the show, just with the whole... She basically exploded her head, and it's... They didn't show it, obviously, and that's how they kind of get away with doing it, but it, the way it was shot and the kind of implications that you know are there, if you think hard enough about it, are clear to see. And, you know, for younger kids maybe watching, they maybe just think, oh, she, she has her head trapped, she can't use her ability anymore, rather than she blew her own, own head up, like she stopped. And Zaheer is just upset that she was um, captured or something like that. And then they later say, you know, she sacrificed her life. And then maybe you just assume that like she died off screen and that that's there. But um, it, it, it's interesting, though, that they, they did that. They set up that whole Police Zaheer relationship throughout the book and then took that away because it played a really strong role for Zaheer in the episode with his um, <clears throat> whole uh, Guru Lahima enter the void, empty and become wind line and just the idea that that scene he's meditating in Lahima's temple saying that line over and over again trying to figure out what he's missing with regards to this ability then uh, Pali comes in he has this moment they say they love each other and he still doesn't realize what is keeping him from doing this ability then she's killed and at that moment he kind of realizes and we realize at the same time that's it the one thing keeping him from being able to use this uh, enter the void ability is that he's attached to Pali he has this love for Pali and that's attaching him to the world and it, it creates this interesting idea that if you take airbending philosophy too far to that ex kind of extreme that you have zero attachment to anything, that you're in a void, effectively. Um, yes, it gives you this cool ability, but it means that you can't care for anyone um, and stuff like that. And That was what Aang obviously dealt with in Avatar The Last Airbender with uh, Katara in The Guru, and he, he was telling her to let go of her, her, his attachment to her as well, but he didn't want to, and that's where we really kind of... Um, really got to kind of respect Aang for kind of accepting that he has this kind of attachment to her and he's kind of willing to kind of deal with that and um i think that the, the key thing is you know like is it like just straight up no attachments or don't make attachments like an issue for you something that's like really holding you back uh but it's definitely an interesting idea that they present that that almost to use this ability you have to take away so much like potential kind of human like interactions and so much from your life just to get this ability and for Zaheer you throughout this episode you kind of wonder was losing Pili worth gaining this ability and um, you see that kind of throughout this episode that um, when Gazan and ming -Wah meet up with him later on and they bring up what happened to her you know he stops meditating uh, and kind of stops floating and kind of comes down and kind of just says you know, she sacrificed herself we're not going to let it be in vain it still kind of is hurting him and stuff like that and so it, I, I did find it really interesting that they gave the villain this really kind of um, strong emotional moment in the episode and um, immediately after they gave like a pretty strong motion uh, strong powerful moment between 
Tonrock and Korra when they're fighting Zaheer and he blows Tonrock off the mountain and to Korra, at least as far as she's aware at the end of the episode and for a long time in the episode 13, she thinks he's dead and that's really kind of strong because we saw in the last episode like three or four characters fall off the side of a mountain and survive. So we as the audience were convinced Tonrock was alive but Korra in that moment and all of the people on top of that mountain, even Zaheer, as far as they're aware he's dead, they don't know that there's people on the side of the mountain uh, with uh, metal cables saving people. Like, he's a waterbender, not an airbender, this is a really high mountain, he's dead, you know, th that's, that's a strong moment that they went that far with it. And This is how you do a really strong action um, kind of set piece over the course of a long episode. Um, and keep emotion high and keep character development in it. Um, another Nickelodeon show, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, again has a lot of action scenes in it, but very few of those action scenes have any emotion to them just because the turtles are never at risk. And even if they're losing a fight, the way they're losing it is never presented as dramatic, that they're at risk really. The few times they've done like those fights have always been when they set up a like emotional connection between the two fighters involved, and that was um, the few times I remember at least where um, April and Karai had this fairly vicious like fist fight in the streets. Like it, it didn't really. Well, I say they both kind of almost like stopped using martial arts a bit and just kind of started pummeling each other. And you know, April got really badly beaten up. She got a few hits in on Karai, I think, but you could really just see that like, like it was very violent and stuff like that. Uh, Splinter versus Shredder, they, they were always very... <laughs> this few that we, times we've seen them fight were violent. But in Korra, like, that's been the case throughout the whole book. And they really stepped it up in the last few episodes. Uh, basically since the death of um, Earth Queen uh, Hu Ting, like, things have stepped up. Like the last episode, really intense fight scene, this one next episode it's, it's really strong stuff um going on throughout the episode um let's probably also mention uh, kuvira uh, we get introduced but well, she names herself in the episode she introduces herself by name in the episode she gets a few lines and the key thing here is like why are you like we've seen her she spoke in episodes before she hasn't really been much of a, like a character we saw she was um Part of the dance, the dancing routine when we're introduced to Su Yin, she reports to Su Yin in armor in a later scene. But just the idea that they wait until the finale to introduce this character to us by name, and then when she does this, super close up on her face, little musical number to underscore it, and it's kind of sinister as well. Really close up on her face, like I'm Kuvira, I'm the villain of Book Four, kind of style thing, like. Um, and then she asks Sue to go with her, but Sue says for her to stay with the um, uh, injured. And so that was really interesting. That's the last we see of her in the episode, I think. I, I still need to watch episode 13 again. I can't remember if she really makes much of an appearance there. But uh, either way, it presents this idea that maybe she's Red Lotus. There's still the idea that Sue Yin is Red Lotus. And, you know, maybe they're working together, or maybe it's just Kuvira and something like that. Who knows? But um, still, like it, it, it was, it was interesting that they did that because it just presented this extra little thing in the back of your mind where you just like you're so used to how TV shows work. Like you don't introduce a character in a finale unless they're important in some way, especially like close up on the face, little musical, new musical theme underscoring what they say. It's that, that that means something um but uh yeah then that's uh most of the episode and then the, the one of the strongest parts of this episode in terms of you know just how awesome it was was um the other team that uh, go in, involved in this negotiation plan and that is um team avatar go to uh, collect the airbenders as part of this negotiation deal and they're met with uh, Gazan. they bring them in to see Tenzin and it turns out he's alive which anyone thinking he was dead was just like no he's definitely not dead he's badly beaten as, as we see here but he's still alive and then you see all the hooded figures in the background and you sort of know 
that they're not there, but you don't know in what way. Like, how are they doing that, but they're not really there, it's just Tenzin, and then obviously it turns out Ming was doing the water puppets, which I thought was a really cool way for her to kind of do that, in that it makes complete sense too that she's used to using water bending to basically like construct parts of the human body, like to make arms. So it makes sense that she'd be able to somewhat um, kind of uh, copy the a general human form for a lot of people like that. That was uh, really cool. And then the fight kind of kicks off, and you get this cool like action kind of chase sequence almost, just when Gazan starts to bring the air, <laughs> air temple down and. Um, you kind of have Bo Lin come to the forefront um, with um, having to kind of earth bend through the mountainside and stuff like that. And some of the visual shots from like the air looking under the air temple were when it's like melting basically are amazing. Like um, when Gazan and Ming Wal escape the temple, you look back and just the kind of landing platform is just like melting off the side of the mountain. And then towards the end of the episode, when everyone escapes, you look back. And the whole bottom of the temple is melting, and then the top of it just collapses. Really kind of well kind of animated, and um, it's moments like that you really see like, okay, that's the animation, but a lot of that is also like the background painters who like just designed this area in general. Really good stuff. Um, and then uh, Bolin gets his, his big moment of book three, and that is that what's been set up for him, like, will he be metal bender? There's something he could there's something special, like he, he's going to do some ability, Su Yin knows he can do something, but he doesn't seem to be able to get metal bending, and it's just, it is a super strong moment because you see that close up on his face, really determined look as he steps forward, the rest of them think he think that he's just sacrificing himself to the lava, and puts his arms out, and it stops, it slowly comes back over, then solidifies, and he just doesn't say a word, though. and then Mako's like, you're a lava bender, and then he's just like, I know, I just found out, it was just really well done, and then he still can't fully, like, take it in when Kai arrives, which, not nice to see that he makes his appearance here, and he's named as Bison Lefty, and I love the kind of humorous kind of thing of, like, they did this with Naga in book one, where, like, she can only hold so many people, but Bison in general are bigger and can hold more people, but this is a baby bison, and like, you're like, how many is this going to be up to hold? And it's just like, Kai's already on it, and then just like, one, two, three, the bison's just like, okay, okay, four, okay, and then the last one hops on, it's just like, no, I'm going down, and it, it, it's just a funny kind of bison moment, and you see everyone meet up, and Kai knows where the other airbenders are, because he was uh, kind of spying around the place, there's other Red Lotus members, this is the cave, and then we end the episode in the um, uh, in this kind of catacombs. We see some of those crystals. They're not in the Bossing Say catacombs, which was interesting. It's just a random cave near the air temple. Uh, it was odd location, but it works, I think. Um, and Korra is um, strapped, chained up to the wall over the red lotus symbol, and they're going to poison her. Interesting kind of concept in the episode as I said at the start and um, just uh, waiting between episodes you know, it wasn't a big wait obviously it just I just didn't know what they were gonna do here like I had loads of theories I just didn't know really wh what to go on based on this and um, just the idea of poisoning her is just like okay th are they gonna kill her but why didn't they just kill her normally is this poison gonna like somehow control her because that's kind of what they said earlier on in the book that they wanted to kidnap her when she was young and kind of control her that way so maybe is this poison going to like control her mind or something like that not really sure didn't expect the kind of reveal that it's kind of to slowly kill her to activate the avatar states at which point they would actually kill her and end the avatar for good which was a really clever idea but yeah that, that's that's my review overall for enter the void um and yeah, if you want more th more of my thoughts on the episode, plus some other fans, definitely check out the Avatar Online podcast. Uh, uh, we did a core roundtable for this episode just last night, um, so definitely check that out. I'll have a link in the description to where you can check out that podcast. We discuss it in a lot of detail. We go through it kind of scene by scene and uh, have some a lot of interesting things to say. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching this review, and bye.